Well, a very, very warm welcome to you this morning. And uh, we will continue this morning with our next installment on change, being a change agent in the kingdom of God. Uh, this morning, I would like to just explain to you what is a change agent and why is it so important for you and for me as believers to function as change agents in the kingdom of God. Let's look a moment at what the dictionary tells us of what is a change agent. Now the Oxford English Dictionary defines a change agent as someone who alters human capability or organizational systems to achieve a higher degree of output or self-actualization. So when we look at this, you will agree with me that the goal of a change agent is obviously to make positive changes. Now, think about this for a moment. As a believer, you are a change agent. And being a change agent is one of your roles as a believer. So, as leaders and as Christians leaders, we must take the risk of embracing a bold vision that challenges the status quo of cherished assumptions regarding the critical role of ministries in times such as this. Becoming a change agent requires courage, a purposeful pursuit, passion and perseverance. If you look at the scripture in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6, it states, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Here we see the Apostle Paul describing change agents as being able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The word that is being used here is the word pneuma, and that refers to the Spirit of Christ, which means that it carries the very mind of Christ. This able ministers are the change agents that carry the fire and the power of God. If we look at the book of Hebrews, in chapter 1 verse 7, it says, And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. You see, those believers who are seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places, in the spiritual realm, far above principalities and powers, these are agents of light. They are light bearers. In Philippians 2 verse 12 to 18, it states the following, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all 
for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Dear believer, you are mandated to remove the darkness from this world and to expose them for what they are. Ephesians 5.11 clearly tells us, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In Philippians 2 verse 15 it tells us that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. As believers and as change agents, we are bringers of light in the world in which we live, that is, in our environments. Light signifies the very presence of God and of His favor. If we look at Psalm 27 verse 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If we look at Isaiah 9 verse 2, it tells us, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shine. If we look at 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, it tells us, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Why all these verses? Because change agents are light bearers. We bring the light and the presence of our God into the environment in which we function and in which we operate. If we look at Philippians 2 verse 15 in the New Living Testament it says or translation it says so that no one can criticize you live clean innocent lives as children of God shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. You see guys God has mandated me and you as believers to change the world for Him. If we look at Matthew 28, and we know this, this scripture, verse 18 to 20, and I'm reading it to you from the message because it puts it so clearly. It says, Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave His charge. So He gave His instructions. And He said, God authorized and commanded me to commission you. So Jesus was obeying God the Father in what he was saying. And then came the commandment and he said, Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of of all I have commanded you, I will be with you as you do this day after day, right up to the end of the age. So you can see here, I love this verse in the message because it, it, it puts it so nice and clear that this way of life is what we need to present. We need to instruct them in the practice of it all. And I want to take it a step further and say we often talk so much about what it is that people need to do, but we don't demonstrate it. And I think that the principle is here that our way of life, our manner of life must be the very demonstration of this. We must become the salt and the light in the earth. If if then we are going to be change agents, we need to be that salt. We need to be that light. And uh, just share with me for a moment, if we look at the scripture in Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16, where it says, and I'm reading from the King James Version, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? 
it is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden up under foot of men. And then it carries on in verse 14 and it says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. It gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that you may see, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Guys, if we look at the scripture, Jesus here clearly says, says to us, You are the salt of the earth. As his creation, we are to enhance the beauty of the world around us. We are mandated to be the salt and the light. You see, your presence as a believer is designed to uplift, to enhance, to bring light and glorify your Father, not to destroy or to harm others. Our very essence and duty is to be the salt and the light. Now, if we look at the Lord Jesus, He, pre he represents salt. Why salt? Because salt preserves life. And Jesus preserves life. He not only preserves life, He sustains life, and He is faithful to His promises to us. The Bible states, we are the salt of the world. But the question is, how can we do this? How can we be the salt of this world? You know, the answer to that is actually very simple. We are to be that flavoring agent to spread the gospel as Jesus' disciples did so that the flavors of God's grace and love can be experienced in this world. We are to share kindness and goodness to those around us. So in our ways, we can help ease their troubles and experience a taste of heaven already here in the earth. We are preservers of life. We are to be that flavor enhancer for those people, even for those who are hard to deal with. Our mission is to help them see how God works in our lives. We need to share the good news and direct them and point them towards Jesus as the sustainer of life. And I would like you to always remember this. You may sometimes question your value in this world and even be at a place where you feel like you have little impact in the earth or that you are weak or small or not even maybe powerful enough. But let me tell you, so is a little kernel of salt that is bursting with flavor and potency to preserve and to enhance flavor. You don't need a lot of salt to flavor something. Be the light, be the salt in your world that spread kindness to others through your words, through your thoughts, through your actions that embodies the goodness of God. In a unique loving way, you can allow others to experience the Lord's presence in their lives by being a good friend a good child, a good parent, a good spouse, 
a good colleague and a faithful son in the house and in the kingdom. I want to take a moment this morning and just share with you some of the principles to let your light shine in this world as a change agent. If we look at Matthew 5 verse 14, and again I'm looking at the message, it says, Here's another way to put it. You hear to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with us, as public as a city on a hill. So what are some of these principles? The very first principle that I want to share with you this, this morning is to let your light shine is to love. If you look at Ephesians 5 verse 1 to 8, let me read that to you and I'm reading it to you from the King James Version. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling saviour or flavour if you want. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named amongst you as becomes saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no warmonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because these things comes because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now you are the light of the world. Walk as children of the light. You see the instruction here is that we are to walk in love. And then the scripture defines the manner in which this needs to take place. And it tells us, as Christ has loved us. That is the standard of love in which we need to operate if we desire to be a change agent in the kingdom of God and being a light bearer in the kingdom of God. If you look at John 13 verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. If we look at John 15 verse 12, it clearly tells us, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Wow. You know, I cannot read this scripture and just be blown away because the standard of living this life in this manner is there because it demands from me and you to love as Jesus loved. It's a sacrificial love. It is a love that dies to itself. It's a life where I become the servant of everybody to whom I express that love. You see, this is why it's so important for us to understand this, that we now must become the very expression of the love of God to our environment in the same manner as that Jesus demonstrated his love to the world. This is a sacrificial love and a love of self-denial and absolute obedience unto the Lord. And we need God's grace to be able to live 
has such a light. The second principle that I want to talk to you about is the principle of integrity. Now, when I use the word integrity, we need to define that. And if we look at the definitions of integrity, it is being defined as honesty, as truth, as reliability, and as uprightness. If we look at Philippians 2 verse 15, it says, That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Guys, this world in which we are living daily are so crooked and so perverse. And that is why this world needs change agents. Because as change agents, we must bring the very fragrance of Christ into that environment. And we can do that through a life that is demonstrating integrity and honesty. We are so deeply aware of the corruption in this world in which we are living at the moment. It is vibrant and it is sadly alive in our nation at this time, even in our government in this time, in our armed forces, in our security forces, in our hospitals. It doesn't matter where you turn, you find the seed of corruption. And I want to say to you this morning, maybe any one of these areas that, I, that I've mentioned, maybe you work in that environment. Maybe you work in the medical field. I want to say to you this morning, God has placed you as a believer in that environment to be the salt and the light, to be a light bearer and an agent of change that brings change in that environment. If we look at John 3.21 in the message still, it says, But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light, so the work can be seen for the God work that it is. Your life and conduct is that which releases the very light of God into your environment. If we look at Proverbs 4 verse 18, it tells us, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. Your conduct as a believer that walks in integrity will result that the righteousness of God in you become revealed more and more and that the impact and the, of the presence of God in you will become greater and greater. Think for a moment of the sun rising in the morning. And as the rising of the sun progresses, the greater becomes the shining of the light that is taking place. You see, if we understand this principle and we understand that we are the bearers of that light, we will understand that the mere presence of God in you and in me, will become brighter and brighter in the environment in which we function. If we look at Job 38 verse 15, it tells us, it says, And from the wicked their light is withhold, and the high arm shall be broken. What does this mean? It tells us that the prosperity of the wicked will be removed as a direct result of the light and their power will be weakened and it will even be made useless. <coughs> Excuse me. In Ephesians 5 verse 11 to 14, it tells us clearly, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. 
Wherefore he saith, Wake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. What is this scripture telling us? This scripture tells us, and it is of utmost importance for us, to avoid the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. It is, you might ask me, what is that? I want to say this, any pleasure or activity that has the outcome and results in sin. But we need to go even further than that because Paul instructs us to expose these deeds because our silence, if we don't expose these things, can be interpreted that we stand in approval of these deeds. Let me tell you this morning that God needs a people who will take a stand for that which is right. As believers, we must lovingly speak out for what is true and what is right. In Job 18 verse 5 to 6 it says, Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candles shall be put out with him. You see, what we need to understand is that sin is exposed by holiness and by integrity in the life of a believer that walk, just as light will expose dirt in dark places. So, I said to you love, I've said to you integrity, these are the principles. Allow me to share with you another principle, the principle of good works. Now the biblical definition of good works is not merely good deeds. Biblical good works encompasses every aspect of our thinking and of our conduct before God. You see, as a believer, my good works are rooted in Christ. Good works are an integral part of God's eternal plan. And therefore, these good works are our highest responsibility. If you look at Ephesians 2 verse 10, it tells us, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that before ordained that we should walk in them. Another scripture that confirms this is in Titus 2 verse 14. It refers here, the wood that it speaks about here is Christ. It says, He or who gave himself for us, that's Christ, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You see, this is the proper nature of good works, not to please ourselves, but to please Christ. And I think one of the greatest principles that you can build into your life as a believer is to constantly ask yourself, in that what I am doing, living, thinking, expressing, is it pleasing unto God? See, that demands a relationship of intimacy with the Lord. Again, Matthew 5.16, that tells us, Let your light shine, so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. He continues to ask the question, can you hide a city that is sitting on top of a mountain? Its light as night, or its light at night, can be seen for miles. You see, if we live for Christ, we will glow like lights, showing others what Christ is like. But the sad, 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 sad part is that so often we hide our light. Because we are quiet when we are supposed to speak. We tend to go along with the crowd, with what everyone else is doing. 
we deny the light. We allow sin to dim our lights. We fail to explain the light in us to others. Or we ignore the need of those around us for the light. I cannot speak about this without thinking of these light towers that is usually built on the rocks in the sea. It is a beacon of light to the ships that passes by. And I see that when I see this, that God is demanding for of me and of you to be those beacons of light, a beacon of truth, refrain, be sensitive in your walk that you do not shut your light off from the rest of the world. Let your light, what am I talking about? The light of that doctrine that you receive from the one that feeds you bread and wine. The light of your holy conversation. Let it so shine before men. Be so evident and apparent unto those around you that they may see your good works and give glory to God. You see, that is that in seeing your good works, they may both praise God for sending such a doctrine, the doctrine of the light that you carry into the world and also embracing your faith. May you imitate you as a holy example and may you be moved to love and serve God as you do and therefore and thereby glorify Christ. Isaiah 58 verse 7 to 8, it, 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 it places it in such clear language. It says, is it not to deal your bread or share your bread with the hungry? that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover them, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Isaiah 58 verse 10 tells us, And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Can you guys see what's, a, what's such a great demand God is placing upon us to be those change agents that we become the light and the salt in this world in which we live. That brings me to the next principle, and that is the principle of humility. And how do we see humility demonstrated in our manner of life? First of all, it is through repentance. If you look at Job 11, 13 to 17, it says, If you prepare your heart and stretch out your hands towards him, if when iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, yet thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear, because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away, and thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning. You see, the light of Christ in you and in me, it is manifested when we come to that place in that position of brokenness, when we break ourselves in humility, it is then that we see the treasure in the earthen vessel that is revealed. And that treasure is the Christ life. 
we look at 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, it tells us, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You guys remember the strategy that Gideon used 300 more men at earthen vessels with lamps. When the earthen vessels were broken, the light of the vessels were revealed to blind and confuse the enemy. So first of all, there needs to be repentance, humility. Secondly, we are not preaching ourselves, we are preaching Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5 to 7 tells us clearly, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light so shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You see, if we look at the life of Paul, the apostle, we see that the focus of Paul's preaching all the time was Christ and not of himself. When you witness, tell people about what Christ has done and not about your abilities, your accomplishments. People must be introduced to Christ, not to you. And if you hear someone preaching about himself or his own ideas rather than that of Christ, beware because that is a false teacher. Again, if we look at the life of Paul, we see that he willingly served the Corinthian church, even though the people must have been deeply disappointed with him. You see, serving people requires a sacrifice of your time of your personal desires and wants and preferences. You see, being a follower of Christ means I'm here to serve others, even when they do not measure up to your expectations. You continue to serve them. This is what Paul did. The Corinthian church was one of the most carnal churches that we read about in the Bible. But yet we see Paul consistently serve them. 2 Corinthians 14 tells us, always bearing about in the body of the die in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, so that the life also of Jesus may be may be made manifest in our body. What is Paul saying to us here? He reminds us that though we may actually come to a place where we think that we are at the end of our rope, we can't do it anymore. We are never at the end of our hope. Our perishable bodies are subjected to sin and suffering. But the truth of the matter is, God never abandons us. All of our risks, all of our humiliations, all of our trials are nothing more than opportunities for Christ to demonstrate His power and His presence in us and through us. We must ask ourselves, would I be able to handle the suffering and the opposition that we see and read about in the life of Paul. You see, this whole thing of the success syndrome or syndrome is a great enemy of our effective ministry. From an earthly perspective, Paul was not very successful. Like Paul, we must carry out our ministry. 
looking to God for our strength. When opposition, when slander, or even disappointment threatens to rob us from our victory. Let me remind you this morning. Remember that no one can destroy what God has accomplished in you and through you. It doesn't matter what people say. The question is, what does God say? And then there's another principle. And that principle is the testimony of the word. In Isaiah 8 verse 20 it tells us, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Dear believer, there will be time that you will experience hardship. There will be times where you will experience disputes between yourself and those that are in the world, sometimes even amongst other believers. Allow yourself and discipline yourself to whatever the situation may be, that it be determined by the Word of God so that there is an indication and you can indicate that there is an obligation to believe and obey the word of God and the testimony because it is a witness between God and man of God's will and of man's duty to perform that will. Your antagonists have no light. The opposition you experience proceeds from the darkness of their minds. They are blind and they cannot see. In Proverbs 6.23 it tells us, For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light, and reproofs us instruction are the way of light. It says here the commandment is a lamp. The word of God is a lamp or a candle to see in order for you to work by and to walk by, it enlightens the eyes, it directs your feet and makes working more pleasant and walking more comfortable. If you look at Psalm 119 verse 105, it tells us, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, the word of God is light. It makes things clear and manifest what is right and what is wrong. It enlightens the eyes of your understanding, whereby persons come to see both their sin and their duty. It directs them to avoid the one and to do the other. Psalm 19 verse 8 clearly tells us, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You know, when we think of instructions, decrees, and commandments, we often think of, of rules that keeps us from having fun. But here we see the opposite. God's Word revives us. It makes us wise. It brings joy to our hearts. It gives us insight. It warns us. It rewards us. You see, God's Word contains for us the guidelines and the light for our path, rather than being chains on our hands and our feet. They, the Word of God points us to where the danger is, and it warns us, and then points us towards the success, and guide us towards that place of overcoming and of success. Psalm 119 verse 130 tells us, The entrance of thy words gives light. It gives understanding unto the simple. The entrance, it, the actual meaning of this word is the opening of God's words. It's like an open door. 
it's like if it's dark in the room and you open the door, light streams in. Now that's just the example that this scripture uses. It's literally when the entrance of the word of God in your life is like it opens that door so that the light can come in. Like what happens when you open the door. It lets in the light or the knowledge. You see, to the natural man, the carnal man, the doors of God's word are shut. You see, as you saturate yourself with the word of God, you become that living word to those in your environment and the light in a place of darkness. I encourage you this morning to embrace your mandate as a change agent and as a light bearer in your environment and in your community. May God bless you as you meditate upon this word. Till next time, God bless you.